I'm Lila, and I'm horizontal. And I'm Renee, and I'm horizontal with Lila. Mm. Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. <laughs> we are we're lying down together. In this episode of Horizontal, I lie down with my housemate Renee. Renee is the most genuinely enthusiastic person I have ever known. When I first met him, I didn't trust him. I thought, is this guy for real? He can't really be this happy all the time. He is. <laughs> it's it's astonishing. In response to his tendency to fold other people's laundry, I coined the in-house hashtag Primo Villain and started regularly asking myself, what would Renee do? The question was like a loving kindness tune-up for me. Renee is quite a hunky fellow and often gender fluid in the way that he dresses, rocking skirts and little tiny short shorts in the same way he rocks a bow tie and a sport coat. He's the housemate who looks better in your clothes than you do. Renee and his eight pack can be seen pole dancing at the House of Yes, often on pole play Wednesdays. He actually defies gravity while horizontal. You can follow his pole journey on Instagram at the underscore renaissance, which is a nickname that I made up for him. I'm pretty proud of it. Renaissance is spelled R-E-N-E-S-A-N-C-E. In the first half of our episode, we talk about our parents' relationships, divorce, showerhead, compartmentalizing emotions, and how Renee comes by his astonishing cheerfulness. You're invited, so won't you please come lie down with us? In Morel's room. Morel's yeah. room is making a guest appearance in this episode. Yes. And he- I've completely jerry-rigged the microphone. It's <laughs> the microphone stand is on top of a a wooden cube that I used to organize my room and it's counterbalanced precariously with four huge books and eight little ones. <laughs> and we're hoping the mic doesn't come crashing down, but yeah. if we yelp That's what happened. That's what happened. <laughs> Crashed. <laughs> so Renee. Yes, Layla. How did you come to hear about Hacienda Villa? Ooh, this is like my origin story. Okay, so here's what happened. I was taking this this course on communication, and it was a really great course. I decided to retake it because I got a lot out of it. So two years go by, I decided to retake this program, and lo and behold, I meet Denez. We're doing group work together as part of this program. And it was one of those situations when you meet someone, just at first glance, you you automatically think in your head, we're never going to be friends. (laughs) We're just like, yes, (laughs) they look so different. They act so, you know, it's just not going to happen. That's what it was like when I first saw Denez. And we're in this 10 week course and we meet weekly. And through the course, we became such close friends and I never would have thought that we would have been friends at all and he started telling me about his home he's like I live in this intentional community and Renee you should come and have dinner one night and just meet all my housemates they're all so cool and so I was like of course I'd love to see your house and meet your friends why not you're my friend and I'm sure your friends are awesome so this was the summer of like 2015 I think and I remember him inviting me over one day for dinner. I come into this beautiful space with all these amazing people. Everyone's just so lively. And I do remember feeling like a little bit overwhelmed because there were so many new faces. And actually, this particular day was the first day that I met you, Lila. And you may or may not remember this, 
but you came up to me, right? And I was like, whoa, who is this person? And you beeline right at me and sat next to me. I was sitting on the sofa on the third floor. And you said, to whom, my dear, do you belong to? And I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> Under what context? And I was like, ah. In my mind, I was like, well, I don't belong to anyone because I'm pretty independent. And I was thinking, I think she means like who invited you. <laughs> to which I then responded was, well, I belong to Denez. <laughs> Um, yeah, those, that was our first interaction. And, and that's how I, I came to be here. And I kind of met everyone. A couple of months later, there was a resident who was moving out to, I think, be with her partner, moving with her partner. And I was invited to apply to become a resident. And I remember Denez had like, he sent me like a Facebook message or something. He's like, hey, Renee, um, would you be interested in living at the villa? And I remember reading, reading that, and my heart kind of bumped and skipped a beat. Huh. And my whole body was just a yes before my mind even said or thought of the words yes. It was just like one of those moments where you, you just know what the answer is. So I replied yes, and I applied, and... Here I am now. And until here. then, mm -hmm. you'd been living in your mother's home, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I had been living the whole time with my mom, and I was looking to move out. And it, and I had never really wanted to like move out before. And I realized, you know, I think it's time. I have work, and you know, I'm, I'm like my sisters are getting older, and like it's getting crowded in here in this house. So I think I'm going to start looking. So I started looking for apartments and places to live in and meeting other people who, who I might be rooming with. And nothing really struck me. You know, I, I had a couple of opportunities that I was like thinking about seriously, but it wasn't like an like resounding yes for me until I was invited to live here. And it was, it was just one of those things where I was like, yep, this is the right move to make for me. I also felt quite certain. And you're in your 20s, right? You're... No, no, I'm not. I'm in my 30s. So that's more of a Brazilian style where, you know, my, my Brazilian family, the kids live with their parents until they get married. Yeah, it's very, it's very common in Latin culture for that to happen. And that's why I never really, I never really like had like the real urge to move it's because i'm very close to my family and you know they were just we have very very strong bonds we argue and we fight and we make up and we love each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's just kind of how it rolls what persuasion of latin are you both my parents um came from colombia so, and I was born here in New York, and I have, I guess that makes me, uh, gives me Colombian roots. What was your parents' relationship like? Ooh, this is a, this is a very interesting. So I have my speculations, right? Because their, their relationship existed before I was even the concept, right? Sure. So it's like this whole thing that existed outside of my existence and so I, I can only imagine based on how they how my mother spoke about my father what it was like when they first met and i'm pretty sure they were like madly in love with each other and it was like an intensely physical relationship that they had and as their relationship developed i think what happened was my father became abusive or or in other words he was probably always abusive and was and used coercion to like have control over my mother and i didn't really see much of it but there was always a lot of tension in the house when i was a child and then i remember ha this one morning i got up and i must have been eight or nine years old i think i was nine years old and I went 
went to get cereal. So it was it's what I ate in the mornings on Saturdays. So I get a bowl, and I remember sitting in my kitchen. I remember my father was in the living room watching TV. I don't know where my sisters were. I'm in the kitchen, and my mom's in the kitchen. And I tell her in, like, just a really nasty voice, get me cereal. Like, just really nasty. Like, imagine a nine-year-old boy just being really nasty. Mm. And she turned at me. She looked at me. And she was, like, shocked. And... I saw that she looked shocked, and I remember feeling shocked. Like I had, like, what happened? What? Did, what? What's wrong? What? What? And she comes to me. And she says, "Sweetie, why did you talk to me the way that you talked to me?" And so I told her, "Well, I just talked to you the way that my father talks to you, the mm-hmm. way Daddy talks to you." And I remember that moment because I thought she was mad at me, and I didn't understand why, and she very like gently and lovingly asked me a question and I just gave her my honest answer. And it was that moment that she realized that my father was actually not a a healthy person for her children to be around. And she, I don't know what happened after that, but essentially she kicked him out and we moved somewhere else. And yeah, and that happened, and that was probably one of the most bravest things that I think a person can do. Absolutely. Yeah, you because know, uh, if you imagine being, I don't know, 28, and, you know, you probably don't have a lot of money, you've got three kids, mm. and your other partner who helps support the household, pays most of the bills, you realize is not a good person, and there's no one else to help you, and you just you figure out how to make it happen on your own, and you're responsible for three other lives. So, and, and you never you said you never saw physical abuse with your eyes, right? But you felt a tension in your household. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. I, I, was the abuse more emotional and mental? Absolutely, it was. Wow, your mom. Yeah, super mom. She worked multiple jobs. Yeah, I remember at one point she did. She had um, part time after work. But and here's the interesting thing: I knew that we were struggling. Like I always knew that. But she made it a team effort, and she would sit down. She would sit us all down. So it's me and my two younger sisters. I'm the oldest, and my sisters are three and four years apart from me. And she would sit us down and she would say, okay, guys, we're a team. It's the four of us. Mommy has to work during the day, and you have to go to school. And you get home from school before mommy gets home from work. So there's here's a list of responsibilities that we have to do together. And my job was to make sure that I brought my sisters home from school safely, that we did our homework, and I would warm up the food that she had prepared the, the night before. And that was kind of our routine. And yeah, there was, a, there was a couple of times there where she did have to work part-time after her full-time job. That makes so much sense to me about you. You are one of the most responsible people I've ever met. And when you say that you are going to do something, I believe you. And it was instilled in you from very young. You wanted to be a good member of the team. Yeah, that was that was all my mom's doing, for sure. She she is very skillful, I think, in raising children. I'm lucky to have someone like that. How do you think your parents' relationship has affected the kind of relationships that you've developed romantically? Well, for a long time, I was resigned about relationships because the only male figure that I really had was my father, and he was a bad guy. You know, my mother never spoke ill of him in front of us. She would always say, oh, you know, he loves you. We're just like not living together. 
but I saw that he, I saw that he never came around. You know, he never called us for our birthdays. He didn't give my mom any money. I saw that. I was old enough to understand these basic concepts, and 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 so for me, that was in my mind not a good person. And so I didn't want to be in relationships because I didn't. I was I was a man, and that means I would be the bad guy. Oh. Right? So I was just like not interested at all. And it took, you know, it, I was I think twenty five before I was like really interested in starting to like want to date women. And before I was just like had no desire for it whatsoever. So when you say resigned, you're resigned to being alone. No, no, no. I was totally happy being alone. I just didn't think relationships worked. What were you resigned about? Well, my only example about relationships was one that, in my mind, failed. Yes. Right, because I was taught that relationships should be between a, a single male person and, and a single female person who partner together, right? And if they stay together for a long time, that's a successful relationship. That was the model that I, I grew up in. That's your mother's view? Yeah, that was definitely... Well, you know, that's... Here's the thing. Here's the tricky thing. She never said that, but at the same time, you know, as a parent, she never really moved on to other relationships because she was so focused on raising her kids right. So she was so intensely focused on that that she never really pursued other relationships. And so as a child, I never was exposed to that in my in my home. So I just didn't have an example that relationships could work. Um, I didn't either. Oh, yeah? My parents, anything that I can remember was not happy between them. My, my parents met when my father went to a child psychology conference in Brazil. And he saw my mother, and she barely spoke any English, and, you know, the story is that they had this whirlwind romance, and... I think he said after two months decided to get married and then it lasted 20 years. And he said, well, I think that's a pretty good track record, right? But I don't, I don't recall them loving. And I remember my father would come home from work and he would, he would go into his garage, which was his sanctuary, his woodworking what would you call it? Studio, man cave. <laughs> yeah, I guess a kind of definitely a man cave. It was his, it was his wood shop mm. where he made furniture, and and that's how he replenished his soul after working in the New York City school system mm. as a child psychologist. Oh yeah, I totally get that. And my mother had, you know, English as her second language. She. I grew up from the age 1 to 12 on Long Island, and she was the only one of her kind, right? She right, was, right. And she was very isolated. And yeah, that must have been tough. It was very, very difficult for her. She's an extremely social person. Mm -hmm. And as, as far as I can piece together, my mom always wanted much more attention from my father than he was willing to give because she didn't have many sources of, of energy. And later on, she did study. She went to NYU for grad school and studied psychodrama, and she graduated. And we have a be beautiful picture of her and myself at her graduation. And she's in a purple cap and gown. And then... I graduated from NYU in 2003, and I wanted to recreate that photograph, and my mother said she was too sick to come, because oh. my mother is bipolar, and she was in a, a depressive funk, mm. and so she didn't make it to my college graduation. Yeah, yeah. My mom got sick when I was 
seven, eight, and nine, she had colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And I think I've told you this before, but I have very few memories before the age of 12, which is when my parents got divorced, which usually points to trauma, but I I don't know what's underneath there mm. because I simply don't remember. Mm -hmm. And even then, even though my father did everything to support her and and care for her so that she could recuperate, I don't think they were happy to be together. Do you think they're the source of their unhappiness had to do with the situation they were in or something more? No, I think that my mother was always trying to get my father to fill the emptiness inside her mm. and he couldn't do that and and even was protective of what he did have to offer and so I think she felt starved Mm. for affection and attention. Yeah. Sounds like perhaps at the time they were emotionally incompatible. That makes sense to me. Mm. And I brought up to my father recently after discovering my own codependency, I said, do you think, do you notice my mother's codependency? Because I notice it. I read the characteristics and I see her all over the place and myself. And he hadn't thought of that. He'd never thought of her that way. But when he speaks of her, he calls her greedy. And it hurts me every time he says it. Mm. In my heart, it's so hard to hear him say that. And it's been years. It's been 20, over 20 years. Yeah, it's like crazy how our parents affect us. And... And a lot of, and it's, it's, you know, I was, man, I was, I was like at this event, I think it was like yesterday, actually. And it was just like speaking engagement, right? And people were talking about stuff that they've learned. And um, there was this woman who came up and started talking about how she had this really great conversation with her parents and how they resolved a lot of issues. And then there's this other guy who was there who was older in his 60s who had a daughter. And he goes, you remind me of my daughter. And I just want you to know, you know, your parents, when you were born, you didn't come with a manual. So I think they were just trying the, the best that they could. <laughs> and, and I was like, it was such a touching moment because it's, it's so true. But also at the same time, like, yeah, our parents definitely affect us whether they know it or not. And the interesting thing is, like, the conversations that you and I have, it kind of makes me aware of how my parents affected me, how I can resolve whatever issues that I created around that. And then I think one of the coolest things about having this experience or you having your experience that you had with your parents is that if you and I were to ever rear children in our futures we would be conscious of that and i think that's a i think that's kind of like a step up in in the human condition well certainly being conscious of it at first for ourselves right because right. i'm finally looking at that and realizing how i recreated that how my mother's grasping and my father's coldness led he wasn't cold towards me but he was cold towards my mother mm -hmm. led to me seeking out unavailable men of all flavors and stripes right, of it. of all kinds men who are unavailable for all kinds of different reasons workaholics or men who were polyamorous and would never never consider a different kind of relationship structure and I wasn't sure that that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Men who were pining for a lost love and weren't really open to me. All different kinds of unavailable men. Men who lived across the country. Men who lived across the seas. Mm. 
Oh, man, you weren't kidding, huh? Oh, my. <laughs> no. But I'm, I'm glad that I am really starting to take a look at it. It kind of reminds me of Brene Brown's talk where she says she discovers that these wholehearted people, what they have in common is vulnerability. So she goes to her, a therapist and she says, okay, all right, well, it's time to deal with my vulnerability, but nothing about my family, okay? Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that's the one you got to go after. And that's, you know? that's, the, that's the root. Mm -hmm. Another thing I realized, it was a breakthrough that I had, was that my love language was affected by my childhood or created or formed mm. by my childhood sure. because whether it was what he wanted or not from the time i was 12 i didn't have a father in the house he lived in new york and i would go sometimes stretches without thinking about him Sometimes I think I would pretend that I didn't have a father. Mm, mm. I would see him Christmases and summers, but that was really it. And he was so far away. And I only realized recently, because I used to tell people, oh, it doesn't affect me. Um, I'm fine. It's better that they're divorced. They were fighting all the time. But of course it affected me. Yeah, you missed your daddy. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yes, and I resented him mm -hmm. for not moving with us. Oh, yeah. Why didn't he come with us? Right, right. And then I realized my love language is quality time. And I get very antsy or upset if someone... In a, that I'm in an intimate relationship with doesn't have any time to devote quality time to our relationship mm. or or gives less than they than they had been you know it's challenging for me yeah I've been there <laughs> it's interesting it's the same I'm the same way in that like if someone like reschedules or like is super late without telling me oh that upsets me so much mm. I'm just like man can't get that 45 so minutes back yeah let me know just tell me and um yeah i think i think i don't know if it has to do with my with me not being around my dad though but it has to do more with oh here's where here's where it comes from i just realized this it comes from not fulfilling on your word and the reason that upsets me so much is because my father used to tell me Hey, today at school, when you're at school, I'm going to pick you up early and we're going to go to the park. Right? So I'll pick you up like at two. And I'd be so excited. You know, imagine you're like seven years old. You're in class. You tell all your friends. You're like, oh my God, my dad's going to get me out of school early. Yeah. We're going to go to the park. He said he's going to bring my kite. We're going to fly a kite. It's going to be so much fun. So the whole day, you're just like anticipating, looking at that old clock, right? Until it gets to two o'clock. And I'm like, yeah, he's going to be here any minute. And it's like 2.05. I'm like, it's okay, he's just a little bit late. He's probably getting the kite together. You know, it's 2.10, 2.45, it's 3 o'clock, school is out, and I walk home. And and this would happen often. Um, and I realize that, like, when people say that they're going to do something and they don't do it, it really takes me off. And that's why, because I had that experience when I was a child Absolutely. of always being disappointed. The unreliability of your your God figure, your yeah, yeah. your dad God. Yeah, exactly. So it was nine? You were nine when I was nine when my mom and my father separated. Yeah. And we lived in Queens. We lived in Astoria. And then I think that spring, we moved out to Kew Gardens, and we had been living there ever since. Did your father take any part in teaching you about sex? 
No, not at all. I mean, I'm pretty sure he did. I don't remember is the answer. Okay. The answer is I don't remember. Here's what I do remember. I remember my mother telling me how sex worked. And it was a very frank conversation. Men have penises. Women have vaginas. Right? And she used her fingers like this. I, I'll never forget this. She took her pointer finger. She wiggled it. It was like, <laughs> men have penises. <laughs> and then my sister's in there. We're looking. We're like, yep. And I was like, I've got a penis. And she was like, yes, you do. And then she took her other hand and she made like a little like circle with her fingers. She's like, women have vaginas. And she would wiggle that. Right. And then she, she, she said, to make a baby, a man puts his penis in the vagina. Right. Just as she would take the pointer finger and put it in <laughs> to the hole that she made. And she would go like that. And she would like jerk it back and forth. And then we'd be like, oh, right. Was it an O of you? Or no, was it? it was like, oh, that's how that works. Okay. okay. And then, you know, a couple... How old were you? Um, I think I must have been... I think I must have been like seven, six or seven when we first had that conversation. Right? But then, you know, you like as a kid, you start having more questions. So, you know, you listen to that. And then I was like, yeah. Then, like, then what happens? Like, does something else happen? Like, because... You know, like, there's, like, this big belly that happens, and what's up with that? <laughs> and so she will explain, well, when, what happens? She goes, like, well, what happens is when the penis goes in the vagina, and she will, like, do the whole pointer finger, the whole hand, <laughs> like, circle with her other fingers with the other hand, put the pointer finger inside the circle she made, and she would, like, kind of... Pump it in and out. Pump it in and out, exactly. She's like, what happens is it feels, like, really good, and there's something that men do, which is ejaculate. And we're she like She used the proper term. She did, yeah, she said that. And then we're like and we're like, oh, okay. And then we're like, so what's that? What's ejaculate? And she's like, well and my mom's like Colombian, you know, English is her second language and she's like, Well, what happens is the espermatozoides comes out. Right? <laughs> and we're like, espermatozoides She's like, yeah, and we're like, what's that? And so she would like draw it for us, right? <laughs> and she's like, and and we're like, oh, those like little tadpole things. And she's like, Amazing. yeah, and there's like a bunch of those. And you know, she would tell us, oh, and it travels into the fallopian tubes, and then it'll go into women have this thing called an egg, right? And it kind of like has to come out every thirty days. And she would just kind of told it, and it was like really like just frank, like this is how it works. That's better than most sex ed in school. Oh, yeah. You know, it was like, it was solid. but Because she told you about pleasure, too. Yeah, she did. She told us she that it felt it good. She said it feels good. It, here's the interesting thing. So and it was, so he, this is really like, so this was all like just very matter of fact, right? But then when it came around conversations of relationships, there was always something more to our conversation, which made me not want to be in a relationship, right? So, like, the biological part of it was all very, like, factual, this is that, there's not really, it was, there wasn't, like, a lot of um, uh, prejudice or bias behind it. But when it came to relationships, things would always, or comments that I would always hear were things like, oh, you know, Renee, you don't want to be in, in a relationship because you're going to lose all your money, right? I would hear that. You know, you're, that girl is just going to take your money and then I'll be like, yeah, I don't want to waste my money, you know? It's a child that you would just be very impressionable and just agree. Or I would hear things like, oh, you know, you don't want to be in a relationship because it's a waste of time, right? So when it came around the conversation of relationship, there was always some type of negative connotation around it. And that, you know, I think at the time had to do with a lot of what my mother was dealing with in the relationship she had with her, with my father. And it must have been really difficult. And she, without, with, I don't think she realized it, but it was kind of projecting that onto her kids. And so that made me just very resigned and naturally about relationships because that's all I heard is that relationships were a waste of time or people will take advantage of you. People who are focused aren't in relationships, right? So I have to study in school get good grades, go to college, right? Only people who are not in relationships achieve those things in my mind because this was the ongoing conversation around that topic. 
Did your siblings draw the same conclusion? I don't know how to answer that question. So we've never had a conversation about that. So I, I don't know exactly what they're thinking. It's okay. You were in the New York City school system. Did you have sex ed? Yeah, we did. We had sex ed. And I was so excited to watch <laughs> porn in school. Ah! And that's not what happened. That is not what happened. That is not what happened. And I, I went to school at a time before the internet, right? So getting porn was like tricky. And, you know, you're like 11, 12 years old. As an 11, 12 you year old boy, were. I was. I wasn't. No, I, and I was like, well, boys, Lila, they just get super horny. They had super, super, I was super horny all the time. I would always get a boner in math class for some reason. Math class? Math class, class. yeah, it was always math class. I didn't have the internet, so I didn't understand. Like, I knew the concepts of how uh, babies were made. Like, I knew the biological terms, but I've never seen it in action. How does it all fit together? What does it look like when the erect penis enters a vagina? I have no idea. Right. I want to see it and jerk off to it. Right? That's my mind as like an 11 year old. Wait a minute. Yes. How did you know about jerking off? Oh, how did I know about jerking off? You know, I don't remember exactly when, but I must have been nine or 10 years old. And I remember. I don't know how this came about, but I think my hand grazed the tip of my penis and it felt nice. And I'm not circumcised, right? So like I have foreskin. And then what I discovered was that if I take my index finger and I place it in between my foreskin and the head of my penis and just kind of draw circles around my head. Twirl. Yeah, I would twirl it right? While the foreskin covered my finger, right? It felt really good. <laughs> and so I would just like twirl away, right? And I would, I would, I would climax, but I wouldn't ejaculate, right? And what did that feel like? I felt really great. It was felt like it was like coming, but without the mess. But was right? it body convulsions? It was, if I were to describe it, it was like, imagine golden flakes sprinkling down your organ, your most pleasurable organ, right? Going into your body, tiny little, little, little ripples of ecstasy, right? And they would just spread from my hips, down my thighs, up my stomach, down my legs, past my knees, up into my chest, out into my arms, and finally like reaching my head and exploding out. <laughs> Marvelous. So it was kind of like that. I can't remember how I actually figured it out that, that my vulva was pleasurable or how I figured out that putting myself on my back in the bathtub and scooting my butt all the way to the end so I could put my legs up the wall and directing the stream of oh, the faucet nice. right onto my clit oh, nice. felt great. Nice. But I figured it out. And it was before I was 12 because I was living in that house on Long Island. Uh -huh. And I did it a lot. <laughs> and it felt like when I came, mm -hmm. it felt like shudders, like waves. Mm -hmm. And then it hurt. Well, I don't know if hurt is the right word, but then I couldn't do it anymore. Too intense. Then it was so sensitive that I couldn't right, do it anymore right. for nice. however long. Nice. You, know, you know, that reminds me that I, I did something like that once too. I had this aunt who I would sleep over her place every now and then on the weekend. And she had this like weird shower 
where she didn't have a shower head. It was just like a pipe with <laughs> water just coming down, right? <laughs> and so it was like warm water. You know, you take a hot shower or whatever. But it was like, you know, a stream of water coming down six feet. And this one time, like, my penis just kind of like hit the water and it felt good. And I got like this heart on. And I was like, well, let me like keep my dick under this stream. Uh, and it felt really nice. Yeah. And I would, I would go to her, her place, I think Saturday nights or Friday nights, sleep over. And then the next day when I shower, I got a little shower head. That's what I called it. A little shower head. I call it my shower head. You only called it that later. Yeah. I was like a grown up and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> I got shower head. <laughs> yeah. Shower head. It was fun. Actual receiving oral sex in the shower doesn't it detract because isn't part of the joy the fact that the mouth is so warm and the temperature difference between the air and the warm mouth whereas if you're taking a hot shower and then someone envelops your cock in their mouth there might not be much of a temperature difference well, you know, everyone has different preferences. Of course. So uh, for me, it's not so much about the temperature difference as much as it is about the suction. Like, I like the suction, and I like when my partner really works my shaft, right? So that I enjoy more than just, like, a hot, steamy mouth. Um, <laughs> but also at the same time, <laughs> I don't really like receiving oral in the shower because... It's like a lot of water and it gets in the way. I like to be comfortable and cozy. And, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to like slip on soap or something. So, <laughs> I just, <laughs> I, you know, it just doesn't really work for me that much. I mean, it happens sometimes, but I normally don't engage unless my partner starts to want to engage, if that makes sense. Yeah. Renee, so what what exploded that idea that you had that relationships just weren't for you? It's not your thing. You're the guy, so you would be the bad guy. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. I was 25, and I fell in love for the first time. And let's call her DCV. Mm -hmm. So DCV. DCV. Yeah, she helped me realize that I was putting all of my emotions in these compartments. And I had a whole house built where each room had different emotions. I would get angry and I would go ahead and put that in, you know, the dresser in the master bedroom or... I get really upset when people bring up fatherhood and that would go into a chest in the basement. Or I'd get really excited about something and I'd go ahead and put that, you know, on the side table in the foyer. Um, and I had all these little compartments where everything belonged and everything was neat, but I wasn't being self-expressed with who I was. And everything was just divided within me. And I was like this little, my all my emotions were perfectly placed in these little boxes. And I wasn't really like living. I wasn't really feeling the world or my experience of the world. And so falling in love with DCV really opened that up for me and helped me kind of un unlock all those dressers and drawers and boxes and really allowed me to lay everything out, take a look at it, and deal with my issues. Yep, that happened. DCV. Mm, DCV. Wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How did you learn then about the concepts of polyamory or ethical non-monogamy? Oh my goodness, this is such an interesting question for me because it has a little bit to do with DCV. 
And so we were dating and she had this like really close friend from college. And at one point he was like living with her and she told me and I was like, okay, that's cool. And then he moved out and then like I, we started really getting a little bit more serious. And I remember that we were going into the city and we decided to take the Long Island Railroad into Manhattan. And she's like, you were waiting for the train. And she's like, I'm sorry, I have to take this phone call. It's, we'll call him T, her really close friend from college. And so she stepped away to take the call. And I can tell that they had like some type of argument when she came back. I didn't know what it was about. And I was really too naive to really ask the right questions or like discover what was really going on. And I just remember thinking, you know, why can't it be cool for the three of us just to hang out? I would be okay with that. And, and I, and DCV was someone who was extremely intellectual and loved to have very intense philosophical intellectual conversations. And that's something that I just was not very interested in. And I knew that I couldn't fulfill her. And I was like, I wish she had a close friend that can fulfill that part of her life. Mm. And then I started asking myself, well, if that's okay, would it be okay if she dated someone else, if she needed something else fulfilled? And then to the end, my answer to myself was like, yes, absolutely. And I just didn't have the knowledge or the framework to really have those discussions. And I didn't know that polyamory was a thing. I just was not raised in, in the household where, I was raised in a household where monogamy was a standard. So that's all I knew. Uh, and then a couple of years go by, I want to say three years go by, and I discovered the ethical slut. Hmm. I started reading that. And then I discovered these forums on polyamory, and then I discovered these meetups for people who were curious or identified as polyamory, polyamorous, excuse me. And I never identified as a polyamorous person at that time, but I knew that I was for sure ethically non-monogamous. I was like, yeah, I just can't see myself being in a monogamous relationship for my entire life. Did um, you have an imagined time limit on how long you could be in a monogamous relationship? How long you could conceive of yourself being happy in a monogamous relationship? Being happy? and uh, No. I just, I knew that I could do it for a long time and be unhappy. Okay. Like I knew that I could be, like I I would fantasize being with DCV and we'd be like into our 80s. And, you know, I would imagine as how we would look like when we're old. And I would imagine like, oh, Renee, would you really be happy? And I was like, no, I wouldn't, but I would probably do it anyway. Mm. Um, because that's just all I knew. And yeah, it wasn't until I think 27 that I just kind of discovered ethical non-monogamy and it just felt very right for me i have very i'm not jealous very often it's not an, ex an emotion that i experience often i do get jealous sometimes uh, like i experience all range of different human emotions but jealousy is not one that really comes up for me and if it does come up i tend to ask why and try to figure out what the root cause of it was or is and yeah, and then not too long after that, I, I think I, I think I met Dinez, and here I am. And, and here you are. Yeah. You're also one of the most cheerful humans I have ever met, and I think you said you've always been this way. Yeah. Yeah. I have, like I've always been very happy-go-lucky, you know, I just kind of, I just, yeah, I don't know, I guess I always wanted to be, as a child, noticed, right? So I figured if I was happy and funny, the other kids around me would like, notice me mm. and want to be my friend, right? Uh, 
I'm just remembering how I also wanted to be noticed. And I did the opposite. Oh, what did you do? I did the opposite. I tried to like ration my smiles so that when I smiled, it would be like this important. glorious thing. <gasps> yes. Like everyone would stop. The clouds are part. <gasps> Lila <Lila's> smiled. <laughs> everyone stop. Look. I smile a lot now, yes, you dear have a listeners. Great smile. <laughs> <laughs> but. Wow, I remember making the opposite decision Absolutely. for that same reason. Well, here's another reason why I became very cheerful. Because I, f I was always the smallest person in the class. And there were a lot of big kids in my class who were a lot heavier and stronger than me. And, you know, New York City public school can be a little tough around the edges. So I knew that if I got into a fight, I would probably lose. But mm. if... If the bullies liked me, they wouldn't want to punch me. Right. Right. So I just made sure that all the bullies at least kind of liked me. And that was my other strategy. And it, it worked pretty well. I think I only got beat up like twice. So it was good. It worked. Wow. Yeah. What beliefs do you sustain that allow you to continue to be cheerful in your adult life? gratitude I just try to find things to be grateful for and that's helpful i have this game that i recently started play, started playing here's how it works i like i have this water bottle that i always drink out of i love that water bottle and i have this like filter in my fridge right you know those filters you that pour water do you know what i'm talking about sure so my particular fridge. We have one on the third floor too. Like, oh, there you go. So you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the one on my floor is so slow. It's like it takes like yes. it takes like I don't know ninety seconds yes. to fill a water bottle. Ninety seconds is a long time when you wait for your <laughs> water bottle to be filled. <laughs> you know. So I play this game. I'm like, let me see how many things I can be grateful for before I fill up this water bottle with water, <laughs> and it just helps the ninety seconds go by. But it's a nice practice to have because you, you know, I like to win games. So you start thinking of things and you're like, well, what am I grateful for? They're, you know, you go through all the basic stuff, like my, my family, my friends, my home. But then that stuff is easy and your water bottle is like, you know, only a quarter of the way filled. So you're like, I need to get more creative. Let's see how many more I can come up with. And you're like, well, I'm really grateful for my pinky, you know, <laughs> I've got a great pinky. I love my pinky. You know? Or like, oh, you know what I started being grateful for is my nose. I love my nose. I've got a great nose. And then you start thinking of other things like, like I'm just grateful that the J train works, you know, because then I can commute into the city really easily. I'm mm. grateful for that. Or and then you start thinking of like other things. And there's this, there's this guy where I work in the building the reception and I recently started thinking man like I'm glad that guy is here I can barely make it into work at nine o'clock and he's here way before me and he opens it up and he makes sure the heat is on hmm. and so I see him every day and I just like I give him one of those nods where I lift my chin up like hey what's up man and he, he's like and then I do that every morning when I see him so he knows so then he looks he starts looking for me Right, because he knows around what time I come in, and sometimes he'll see me before I see him, and he like gives me that nod. He's like, "Hey," I was like, uh -huh. no. so I think gratitude is is definitely one of the reasons that keeps me with a cheerful mindset. I have a daily gratitude practice that I developed after I went to Stephen Jenkinson's weekend long seminar on grief and dying at the Row Center that my friend Matthew took me to. His, his whole work is an extremely poetic rendering of how we can carry, this, these are his words, how we can carry what knowing we're going to die does to us every day. Yeah, like facing our mortality, right? It's what being aware of our mortality, how that changes our behavior and our outlook. 
For instance, today, I have often some tension with my mother and I wonder if they can hear that. We'll find out. <laughs> I often have my my mind wanders when we're speaking and I don't always give her my full attention. And today I wanted to get in touch with her earlier to tell her I was going to call her a little bit later than our regular time. And I couldn't get in touch with her and usually she's home at that time. And I was already triaging because the last time that I couldn't get in touch with her at a time when we had set, she was on the floor, incapacitated, and the door had to be broken down so she could be brought to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And just the thought of her mortality. My mother is older. My mother is now 75. And when I thought, wow, she could really, she could... She yeah, could she die gone, today. Yeah. She could she could be gone today. Mm -hmm. And then I connected with her through FaceTime and I was like, Mom, hi, you know, and I had a very different warm response to her, right? And the same thing happens for myself when I recognize my mortalness. When I came back from that seminar, which was about probably a year and a half ago now. One of the things that he said that really stuck with me was how people wake up in the morning kind of like cursing the day. And that's something that I would do because as you might be aware, I am not a morning person. Mm -hmm. right, right. <laughs> yeah. And I would wake up being like, fuck, I'm awake, fuck. I don't want to be awake. I want more sleep. Fuck, 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 fuck. And I th realized what an absurd way that was to enter my day mm -hmm. if I would like to cultivate happiness in my life. And so now I wake up, and even if it's earlier than I want to, even if my very first conscious thought is shit, at, right after that, I go, and I stretch out my arms and legs and I go, alive. Nice, nice. Alive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this healthy body. Thank you for the sunlight streaming through my curtains. Thank you for this day. I'm alive. I'm alive because truly I always want more life. I always want another day. Even at, at the moment where I, when I was 13 or something held a knife to my wrist my wrist I still couldn't conceive of really not wanting another day mm -hmm. yeah and that gratitude practice has shifted the timbre of my days nicely done Lila thank you good work man <sighs> The second half of this episode has been released separately by popular demand. If you'd like to become a patron of the Horizontal Arts, support me on Patreon, a website for crowdsourcing patronage. Having patrons allows artists like me to buy equipment, schedule cross-country and global tours, and devote my time to creating more and more horizontal goodness for you. Becoming my patron has delicious perks ranging from exclusive photos and behind-the-scenes video content to handwritten postcards, and I'll tell you that my handwriting is ridiculous, <laughs> spring-cleaning phone calls, and creative input on future episodes. You can become a patron for a dollar a month on up, and the rewards just get more sumptuous. Patreon.com slash Horizontal with Lila that's p a t r e o n dot com slash horizontal with Lila. Horizontal's theme music was created by Alan Markley. You can find his gorgeous blue eyes and rock star visage on Instagram as Plastic Cannons. My saucy cover art was designed and illustrated 
by Shauna Shea. Check out her gorgeous character illustrations on shaunashay.com. S-H-A-N-A-S-H-A-Y.com. Every episode is mixed and mastered by Owen Muir of Self-Disclosure Productions. Owen's own podcast, Self-Disclosure, in which people speak openly and often for the very first time about their experiences with mental health, is coming soon. Listen, if you are a person with feelings. For most things horizontal, head to horizontalwithlila.com and sign up for the mailing list. It's getting really exciting on Horizontal with Lila. There are detailed show notes with vocabulary words. There's a glossary and links to all sorts of informative articles, sexy guidance, and sensual photos. And if you sign up, they'll be delivered right to your inbox. Thanks for listening. I have huge appetite. Bam.